I thought I'd start with you, Nora, because you are actually the bona fide cover star here <laughs> today. As you've all seen, uh, Nora was, uh, we were very happy to have Nora on the cover of our latest issue. Um, I'll let you guys introduce yourselves and the operations that you, you represent. But Nora, just start with you because you recently announced your, your fund, right? Yes. So hi, everyone. My name is Nora Baby. I still get emotional when I get that, see that picture because people like me never make the cover, so <laughs> uh, there's a long story to that. Uh, I'm a co-founder of Unconventional Ventures, Nordic VC, focusing on impact tech companies built by diverse founders, or underrepresented founders is the key word, but I think what we should talk about is historically excluded founders, and that is women, people of color, immigrants, LGBTQ+, and so on. Wonderful. We'll get back to that. There's so much to talk about. Uh, Samira, uh, you also st recently started a new job, so congratulations to that. Talk about what your role is there. Yes, yeah, so I'm investing for SAB Green Tech, uh, and we're looking for companies, innovative companies, early stage, who are uh, contributing to climate change uh, mitigation and also transgressing the planetary boundaries. Wonderful. Do you like your new job? I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and Eric, uh, you perhaps most rooted in the fashion industry of all three here. Uh, talk about your role at, at H&M Group and how the, the collab uh, entity you know, fits into the whole universe there. Right, yeah. So, yeah, I, I'm Eric. I work for H&M Colab, which is, we're basically the venture investment arm of the H&M uh, group. Um, and we're investing in three different areas across uh, our industry. So it's sustainable fashion, which is the category that I head up. And we're investing there in order to uh, find companies that can help us meet our sustainability targets. Uh, and then new retail, we're looking for, you know, what are the future business models of the fashion and retail industries? And the third category we call enablers, and that's about strengthening our customer offer in different ways or being more efficient internally. Mm. I mean, you actually have some of your investments here today, right? Yeah, yeah. A couple uh, of companies. Nora and, and Petri, Nora from Renewcell and Petri from uh, IFC. It's great to hear. Yeah. I'm going to follow up on that. When you work with, with these investments, uh, I think many people are wondering, uh, are, is it mostly for the benefit of the greater H&M group, or as you mentioned, is it for the fashion industry as a whole? How, how is your perspective on that? Yeah, I, there's, you know, we never want any exclusivity when we invest in companies. It wouldn't make sense uh, as an investor because we want the companies to be able to grow, t grow into, you know, as big companies as possible. Um, and also, uh, it wouldn't make sense for us because our ambition is to be at the forefront of you know, leading the industry uh, to, to change and we want the whole industry to be able to, to uh, change. So yeah, no, no exclusivity. No exclusivity. And, and can you give us some examples of types of technologies or companies that you are looking for right now? Um, I, all kinds. I mean, uh, within sustainable fashion, we have invested quite a lot in like recycling technologies, uh, new types of uh, innovative materials uh, like Renewcell and Infinited Fiber Company. We have invested in two companies that do uh, new types of dyeing technologies. Um, and yeah, w w it doesn't need to be just, you know, materials and processing, but it can be anything that has to do with sustainability. And is there anything that you like are looking for right now that you that's not in your portfolio that new type of of, uh, of technology maybe you can't uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> reveal yeah, that no to yeah colleagues here uh, that that's fine uh, you know we're happy to t to speak to everyone but um, you know I'm really interested in like how do we take the next steps within transparency and traceability uh, we've looked at a few companies in, in that area but we haven't invested in any so far yeah. uh, so that that would be uh, really interesting. So, I mean, I'm going to move over to you. I mean, SAB Green Tech sounds like a big, huge uh, uh, sort of chunk to, to be a part of. Uh, are you looking at specifically fashion as well, or how does that fit into the whole uh, area you're looking for? Yes, yeah, so fashion is interesting to us since it's about 4% of global GHG emissions. Uh, and we are mostly focusing on the deep tech and hardware part, uh, making all kinds of upstream solutions, interesting, like the ones you're mentioning, but like this one, Spinova, new materials, new ways of 
producing, energy savings, and so forth. Of course, circularity is really interesting to us. And can you describe the, the process for choosing which company to invest in? Do you have like a checklist or is there a way of working? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, well, one part is to partner with uh, Eric and other investors like Nora as well. Uh, and also looking at the sustainability scope, so really our impact scope, if you would say, at what scale, uh, how sustainable and f future proof is the financial model and so forth. And then, of course, the team is really important to us. We're going to talk about scale uh, also uh, further out in the program, but th this to me is something that's uh, something that's crucial for fashion industry's issues. So is, is that particular, you don't want solutions that are, are minor, it needs to be sort of uh, expanded on, onto the whole industry? Well, that's an interesting question, because minor, minor things in this space can actually have quite big effects or large effects at scale, but uh, we're mostly interested in uh, platform solutions. So solutions that are maybe not only subject to one single product, but that can be scaled upon uh, uh, multiple applications. Mm. Mm. We're going to get back to that. And, and guys, feel free to, to uh, play off of each other as comments. But Noura, I want to go back to uh, unconventional ventures and, and the work you've done there. You released a report, uh, um, I think it was last year uh, by, this, by now, right? That is kind of the foundation of, of your perspective. Can you talk about that report, the findings, and, and what you kind of, kind of aim to do about it? So I think two things. I mean, if, if we want to change something, and we saw a great presentation about systemic change, and that's what we're all about, we really need to know where we're at to understand where we want to go. And you can have as many visions as possible, but you also have to know what has been done prior and why it's not working. So as a, as a venture capitalist, we took a deep dive at the funding gap, looking into what are the metrics and what is going on in an industry. And it's, it, last year was our third report, actually next one being launched within a month, and it's, it's not looking beautiful, but it tells us the story and the data that we need in to order understand how to improve. So as an example, I mean, we've been very progressive in the Nordics, and we love to talk about you know, how gender equal we are compared to the world, but unfortunately, only less than 1% of all capital goes to sole female founders. Now, it can't be the 99% of all white men are doing better than women, as an example. There's something wrong there. And, and if we look at the profitability or even you know, how incredibly well female founded companies are doing, then we can see in the Nordics as an example. I mean, the global number is um, two and a half times better. In, in, the, Nor um, in the Nordics, it's 45% better in terms of revenue compared to male-founded companies. So, I mean, if investors are really about making great business decisions, then we're literally not making great. So why is that? So uh, we're really moving into this space with a top-down approach as well as supporting the bottom-up approach. So being closest to the capital was the only way we knew how to create that systemic change. Wonderful. And, or not wonderful, the situation is not <laughs> wonderful, the work you do is wonderful, sorry, sorry about that. Um, but, so, but so talk about how you are addressing this. You yes. mentioned sort of bottoms up and top down as well. How do, you, how do you go about that? Of course. So obviously bottom up is the founders that we invest in. That's one part of it. But I think in order to create any kind of change, it's not on a soul. It's not just us that is going to be the change makers. We need to create transparency as we do in all type of industries. And we need to build an inclusive ecosystem where we're all stakeholders collaborating. And when we talk about stakeholders, we talk about all investors, but obviously the bigger funds and the later stage investors, but also stakeholders like institutional capital and private capital. So I think what we're setting out to do are not only great business decisions, uh, but really creating that inclusive infrastructure. And that's what we're trying to do, impact. Uh, so we have these three layers, as I mentioned. So it's the ecosystem. It's what we represent, because representation matters, and that is incredibly catalytic, but also the founders that we invest in. And in types of, is it all 
types of companies, all types of technologies? How do you pick and choose? How that? do you pick and choose? Well, we have uh, some soft spots, obviously. Fashion tech being one of them as an impact investor. And within ESG lens, we really closely look into fashion tech. So we invested in a company called Easy Size, which is actually a sizing tool. Uh, so it's a plug and play. Um, and what it does really is actually minimizing returns by 30 to 40 percent. Mm. And that is a huge waste that is literally being um, you know, creating incredible uh, numbers also for the SMBs that is collaborating. Um, but we are looking into this space very closely. Obviously, transparency, um, and, and I think you kind of mentioned what we're also looking into. But there are also some other aspects. I mean, within health tech, femtech is really important for us. When we look at ed tech, when we talk about fintech, we don't talk about it. Um, we talk about uh, inclusive fintech. So that's beyond, you know. And I think what we do is that we are adding both the environmental and social aspect to it. So ethics, I know it's a big elephant in the room, but ethics is a huge part of what we look at as well. So I think one thing that has really been lost in all of the industries that we look at is, is really the, the social aspect of it. And that's where we see that we can really drive change because it's both important for growth, it's both important for the DNA of what products and services we're seeing, and it's also part of really being part of that sustainable and equal world that we want to be part of. And it starts with equality, ownership, equity. Mm. And you are to be defined as kind of like an up-and-comer in the investment space, uh, so, to sp so to speak. And Samira, you, you represent something, uh, more of something established, so to speak. Uh, do you bring in some of these perspectives when you go into uh, SBA, for instance? Uh, can, do you recognize yourself in, in worst perspective? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's key for successful investments as well. And uh, I've been working with a concept called gender lens investing, which is basically looking at founders and also uh, capital going into companies and so forth in each investment you do. So there are some quite interesting in initiatives, but this is absolutely a success factor. <laughs> Wonderful. I want to go back to this whole notion of, of I'm so curious about how you go about choosing the companies and what cri criteria and, and what, what processes. We have a lot of companies here today, some of them well-funded, uh, some of them more in, in, in the beginning of their journey. And I know also we have in, in the audience uh, people who, who work with, with startups and are looking to go into f finding capital. So. Uh, Eric, maybe we start with you. Can you go a little bit more granular in terms of how you go about, uh, you know, assessing the companies that you you? Because uh, I'm sure you say no to a lot of them, right? <laughs> what what yeah. makes a no and what makes a yes? Um, I, I think you know th there's no set formula to how we work. Uh, honestly, uh, it's isn't there? I thought it no, was. No, yeah, you know, there's not not like a, a list that we take off. But I think you know there is gut feeling. Um, there is the experience of the investment team, um, and there's the for us as a strategic investor, there's the knowledge about you know what is strategically important to the H and M group. Right. And then of course we you know we analyze the business case, we do our due diligence, legal, uh, financial, um, uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, and then when we in the investment team we feel like okay we have a good case here, we put together a deck and we present that to our uh, investment committee, mm -hmm. and they make the decision. Um, so yeah, uh, sorry if I disappoint, but there, there's no like, th and it looks honestly, it looks different every time. Sometimes we do the due diligence, you know, before the IC, and sometimes after. Um, yeah. Right, right. And and you know, sometimes we meet a company um, like Renewcell, for example. We met them the first time in 2012. Um, they were they were looking for capital and took us until 2017 until we invested. Mm. It doesn't need to take five years, but you know. You it can be months as well, so the process is very different for us. Uh, every will you give advice to a company at that stage? Where so will you give advice to a company that yeah, you perhaps sure. say no to or say, not right now, we have to wait until this happens and so forth? Exactly, yeah. yeah. Uh, that often happens that we say, yeah, what you're doing is really interesting, uh, here's what we would like to see before we invest. Mm. Uh, and that can be different things. Yeah. Right. Uh, Samira, back to you. Uh, is there a checklist? Is there <laughs> formula? No? <laughs> Formulas, yeah. <laughs> now, if we had that, I think we would be very successful, all of us, in all our investments. Right. But 
I think that get to know the company and really the team, the founders, but also other key stakeholders, and follow them over time. That would be like the key success factor, I would say, and really see that they get the traction that they are promising to get. Um, in many cases, we get uh, we get companies that want to have or need capital, but they need it like yesterday. Right. So we are we're closing this in September. They're saying there's no way for us to be able to make decisions that fast or very seldom, at least. So giving us a long runway and follow companies for a long time, that's really a good one. So have patience and build relationships over time. That's a good good tip. Yeah. And generally, if you look at our investments, we look at if, if the investments give a lot of impact at high scale, we can take on more revenue risk. And if we have the opposite relation, then of course we want to be much safer on the, on, on the financial returns. Mm -hmm. Nura, can you give, I mean, you recently started, and I think, you, 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 uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think you might invest earlier stages than, than your colleagues here as well. So I'm sure that, that cha maybe you have some companies that are like, I need it now, tomorrow, yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, exactly. So we go in at pre-seed and seed, and pre-seed is might be even pre-pre-seed. Um, and yes, we're at early stages. We invested in ten companies, but uh, now we have a proper fund. So I'm really looking forward to being more of a catalytic investor. Um, and maybe I think you know. One thing that dawned on me when I entered this space, because I've literally come from founder perspective and became an investor, was that it really isn't a formula. Um, and that's you know both positive and scary sometimes. But I think what we really look at, and that's kind of a very holistic approach from unconventional ventures, um, we really look at how much they've been able to achieve without capital and how much more are they able to achieve with that capital. Because the capital really becomes a tool and not a necessity for that company or product or service to exist, which tells us that they're, by default, they're actually coming from a problem-centric, right? So they're really coming from a customer-centric approach to that problem. And then also realizing, you know, what kind of competences do we have in-house to be able to be that kind of support to them and the ecosystem we can build around them. So that's the approach that we have at really early stages. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the Nordic perspective here. Obviously, we are here sort of celebrating the, the, the connection between Sweden and Finland, and that's what we want to do. Uh, how do you look at, uh, you know, the Nordic landscape in terms of innovation and, and you know, interesting uh, companies? How do we measure up from a global perspective? I want to ask this to everyone, so maybe start with you, Eric. Uh, I, really well, I think. Um, it's, I mean, we, we have some legacy industries in both Finland and, and Sweden, like, you know, the forest industry, the cellulosic industry. Uh, in Sweden, we have the car industry. And we see that, you know, they act as, as a base for a lot of the innovation uh, that's popping up. Um, and I think, you know, we have a lot of uh, good examples uh, of, comp you know, startups that have made it big. Like, you know, we have Klarna, we have Rovio in, in Finland, we have uh, uh, Spotify. And I think they also, that, ac that acts as an inspiration to young entrepreneurs. And entrepreneurs today, they're fearless because they know, I, and I think that in a good way, you know, th they know that they can make it. Um, and they, <laughs> they probably think they have a formula for, for making it. And mm -hmm. I think that's, that's a real positive force in, in this uh, ecosystem. Samira, same question. How do, we, how, do we, how do we do here in the Nordics? Yeah, I think we're doing well as well. And what we also see is like second and third round entrepreneurs who are really experienced. Uh, which also brings a lot of value into the in, into the market. Uh, we see that Sweden has been, been leading startup-wise, but Finland is really catching up uh, and quite big internationally as well. Uh, and all our companies, almost all of them, are going international, which is a really good or success factor to us reaching large markets from start. Mm. Again, with the, with the scale. Yeah. Uh, Nora, do you look at companies from, from all over the world or all over the Nordics? What's your, your uh, perspective? Well, we'll take a look at from a European perspective. Um, and I would say from a global perspective, obviously we have very close 
um, relationship with the U.S. as an example because they're in the forefront when it comes to the whole diversity aspect in, in investing. Um, not that they're doing better. They're just having very much open conversations than we're having. Uh, so I would say, um, and I hate to be the one to drag it down, we have everything in place to be the world leaders. There's nothing that we cannot lead in the conversation of you know, really doing well, but we're unfortunately very fat and happy. We think that the format that we've been using, you know, scaling at all costs is what should continue. And now the question is, we need to mend at all costs. And what are we, you know, uh, what, are we, what are we deciding to do when knowing that it is not business as usual? And I would love it if the Nordics could really take advantage of the diversity impact that has a direct link to profitability and revenue and innovation. But it's like we're seeing it, we're pretending that that can wait. All right, thanks, guys. We're now going to do a deep dive into some of these new uh, exciting companies. Uh, Nora Bave, uh, Samir Aisi, and Eric Carlson, thank you so much for coming here today. It's been a thank treat. Thank you.